My name's Daniel Prober. I'm Head of IT Innovation for a not-for-profit called Camford. I've worked with them for four years. Has anyone heard of Camford? Yep, we're amazing. I'm just going to say that now. Uh, uh, so I'm going to, that's kind of, so we were established in 1993 and we support girls in getting into education throughout five countries in Africa. Over our time, we've supported 1.4 million girls to go to school, um, which is quite a big number. We're quite proud of that. And that number is increasing dramatically at the moment. We've been on Salesforce now for seven and a half years. And to say we do everything in Salesforce is probably still understating how much we actually do in Salesforce. Almost every business function now runs on Salesforce now that we've shut down our external finance system and are using financial force. Um, and as you can see, that's, I'm not lying, that is true. We've got 180 users globally, which is our full comp, like staff complement across all offices, with a few spare for external developers that help us out here and there. And so today, I'm going to show you a blank screen. <laughs> mm. Nope, there we go, OK. Yep. There's also a blank screen button, it turns out. <laughs> so today, I'm going to give you a very different example of the way that you can use Salesforce, in that we don't use any of the sales or service cloud functionality. We use it in a very bespoke way. Everything I'm going to talk you through is near entirely custom built on the platform. Very little of it is off platform. And apart from a small amount of CSV use and uh, open source application, it all happens in Salesforce, every last bit of it. So this is an example of what a typical student looks like in Salesforce. These are all objects. And these are the two that you'll be familiar with. These are the standard objects. We use the account specifically we, because we have to implement pretty strict sharing rules within our organization. We don't want someone in our Zimbabwe office to be able to find out information about students within our Tanzania programs and things like that. So the accounts are there to enable us to share data effectively and efficiently. Every single student has a contact record. And then the most important record, that's why it's so big, is the academic record. Every student will have one of these per year that they are supported on our program. This allows us to learn about their progression through the, their time at school and allows us to report back to donors. And then each one of those will have a monitoring visit where we go to see what entitlements they've had, how well they're getting on at school, a payment, which is the main thing I'm going to talk about here today, and their exam results. So again, we can report back to donors. And more importantly, learn about the effects of our programs where we're working. I've done it again. OK. So the data flow, how data gets into our system. So student, a student is selected, and that happens in that circle, does no justice for the whole process behind it, I just want to say. Um, I couldn't think of a better way of doing it. But we select a student to go with our local community partners. It's not us that just flies in and does it. A community partner would be the person that actually is working to find the most marginalized girls that need the support to find out what kind of support they require. That information is then fed into Salesforce using an application called Open Data Kit. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. It's an open source application that runs on Android phones. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. And in some cases where you don't have internet access, we use simple CSV files. Data sent into main office, and then it's data loaded into the system. Each contact, once they've been verified, has an academic record created for their current year. This then, based off of that, flows into a payment processing system where we can assign entitlements for them. Um, and ultimately, it feeds back into the monitoring program so that when we go to visit the girl to find out what they've received, we've got a form pre-populated with shoes, socks, uniform, school fees that we just tick those boxes, and it feeds back into the process again. And that's why it does go around in a loop for a full four-year life cycle. We, try to, we commit to support girls through their entire duration in secondary school, which is four years in all of our countries of operation. So I, I thought I'd do a little bit about ODK and what it is and the whole process of how the data goes in as well, because not many not-for-profits use it, or not as many as I'd like to see use it. It's fantastic. It's open source. It's free. It costs us about $24 a month to run, and we monitor our, our entire program, which equates to about, I think it's about 240,000 submissions a year over mobile phone. Um, and so. It says up there what it is. This is what it looks like. So from a training point of view, it's pretty intuitive how to use it. Although one of the biggest challenges we have, or had, no, no longer a challenge anymore, is not many people when we first started rolling this out had ever used a, a smartphone. 
And so that was the initial test was actually just teaching people how to use a smartphone. But now we're finding more and more people are getting low cost smartphones. The actual training requirements is more just on the content going into them rather than how to use the application itself. So data is submitted using these forms and it goes up into an aggregate server. And then we use an application called Jitterbit, which is a business integration tool, to pump that data straight into Salesforce. We don't at any point have to go into that aggregate server and export. It automatically pushes it all straight into Salesforce. Then something which we, we hadn't thought of when we first rolled it out that we added on was a very simple SMS sending it back to the person that submitted the data because quite often an NGO will take, 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 but doesn't necessarily send back a recognition to say thanks for the data or there's a problem with this data. So we use Twilio, which is a cloud-based SMS platform to send back a message for everything that comes in to say thanks in effect. It's, it's pretty simple, but it makes quite a big difference to our community activists who are doing this for free to know that this data isn't just going away and no one's looking at it, that we are actually sending back something to show gratitude. So now I want to talk about the core of the difference in how we're using it uh, within the system. So we, around about 2013, 2014, secured quite a large amount of funding, which meant that our program increased in size dramatically. And you can see the number there. These are just estimates. And within a year, we went from supporting 25,000-ish a year through school to 118,231 or something around that number, which is a dramatic increase. Now, prior to what we're about to talk about, that was all being handled in Excel. Every single one of these students, it was exported from Salesforce. Someone had built a crazy macro that would extrapolate this information, link it up to donors. Then it would be put into our Sun data system. If an issue was found during that kind of period of macronism, someone would edit the Excel file and then put it in the Sun system. So we'd get to the end of the year, and we do something every year, which is called the evidence of investment, where we prove to our donors and our supporters what we've done. And that process used to involve reconciliation between Sun and Salesforce. And the, the amount of issues that we would find meant that it was a three to four week process of an entire finance team, program, and impact team locking in together to say, what the hell has happened here? How have we got these students here and not in here? Or why are the donor codes different? Um, so as you can imagine, it's a headache. So we look to change that and build the entire system within Salesforce. So at no point should data be amended or changed in Salesforce, outside of Salesforce. Every action that you take on your data is stored in Salesforce as your master record. And you'll see at the end, we've gone one step further now with the finance system changing as well. So just to give some ideas on some of the bits about the payment. Within our five countries, there are 51 different entitlements available. I hate the term entitlements, by the way. It's really wrong, but there isn't another way of explaining it. And this could be anything from shoes, school fees, exam fees, transport costs, pocket money. There's 51 of them. I didn't want to put the list up. It's, it's a hard enough thing to look at as it is. Um, each student's payment is tracked. And by tracked, I mean when we actually submit the cash, we get a receipt back. And quite often these are made to schools. So we'll make a payment to a school who will send us back a receipt for the funds, which is then logged within the system as well. So that when it comes to an audit trail or say DFID come into auditors, we have a complete clear visible audit trail down to the individual student. So how, how, how is it different? I mean, it sounds quite simple at this point, but there's, there's one really weird thing about the way that we procure things. To make sure that we get the best return on investment for our donors, we don't just go out and buy from the first supplier. Because quite often in Africa, that isn't the best price you're going to get. So we have three different levels of procurement process. We, we buy shoes in some countries at a district level or at a countrywide level, which we have to cater for that cost. Now, within one of those districts, because we might have a good shoe deal, there might be two schools that get a different cost to what, a different co to what the district cost is. And equally, there might be a custom cost because one of the girl's aunts makes shoes and does it really cheap. So we have to be able to factor all of that in without manually manipulating data so that it's all stored in one place. So here's an example of how the system is logically trying to calculate the right cost to work. So take transport as an example. You can assign a, an individual student cost, and the system will pick that up as the first cost. It will ignore anything else further down the list. A school cost, so at this point we've got a cost assigned of $50, which is transport's been paid for at the school level. 
So within this school that this particular student might be attached to, all students would be assigned a cost of $50 for the specific student we're talking about now. But the neighboring school, we, we may have purchased that at a district level. So they'll get a district cost. Again, this is all built within Salesforce. This isn't a macro. I <laughs> want to really emphasize I don't like macros. <laughs> Um, so another example of that where there's no cost assigned here, so the system skips all other costs, grabs the 120 and assigns that to the individual student. Is everyone following at the moment? Does it make sense? Good, because it didn't make sense to me at first. Um, and so I've already covered that. No, no, so, so in reality the way that looks is you have your academic record I talked about before. You have a payment per student. There can be up to three payments made per academic year. Um, and then within each individual payment, we link off to a school cost, a district cost, and adjustment. And each one of these has a cost per form because school exam fees are different dependent on form or grade that a student's at as well. So you can imagine there's a hell of a lot of data that goes into the actual preparation of this. Um, and so it sounds a lot more complex than what it is in reality. What comes out is a very simple payment, which we, allows us to pay. Um, and we have something new that we've added recently, which is an adjustment. And the, adjust, the adjustment is when our monitoring system has picked up on a student that didn't receive shoes, but we've paid the school for the shoes. So we make an adjustment at the student level that then deducts that money from the next payment made to the school. So what does that look like in reality? Well, I could have showed you all the objects together, but I thought I'd show you this. This is a very simple Visual Force page that we've made that enables you to have a very simple portal into the management system. Rather than running reports and exporting data, this here allows you to change these references here, and this will automatically populate via a SOC call query in the background in Apex, and pull out information within the country you're working here. So you'll see here, I'm looking for students in 2015, term one, and Zimbabwe is a country, and that student type is a specific type of student. We've got three different student types within the system. So it allows you to focus in on a very specific subset of students. Equally, I can include a district and focus into just students within that district itself. And all of this is just a very simple query running in the background to generate this in a visual force field. But what the key here is, you have a very quick image without running a report of what's going on because you can see the payments created here and ones that are unmapped. And unmapped is our way of saying, well, you haven't actually calculated the cost yet. And so there's a series of buttons we've generated that enable you to force update costs, prepare our payments for our finance system. And these two here, and there's another one that's not visible at the moment because I'm at a country level, allow you to pull out the schools that don't currently have a payment for you to start updating their information. And when you press those buttons, what comes out the system automatically is a CSV file. No macros, there's nothing in it. And all the, the person that's processing the payment has to do, they'll have a list of students with all the core Salesforce information. They get to verify the form, assign any of our specific donor coding if it isn't already within the system, and then go through the list of entitlements that are available. Now, these are tailored based on country. So you never see the full list of 51 entitlements on a single file. Because Zimbabwe only have a subset, the total is 51. So they're tailored that if you're in Zimbabwe and you press it, it only provides the information you need to populate to generate a payment in the system. And all you need to do is assign trues throughout it, and then using dataloader.io or the offline version, upsert it into Salesforce, and away you go. Now, at this point, I thought it was very simple on how it works, it was quite logical. But what we found was quite frequently we were getting people saying, well, no nothing's happened, there's no data there, none of the students were there. So we built in a, a fairly sophisticated logging system so that whenever someone comes to me to say nothing's happened, I had a complete log and audit trail of every single action that had happened within that payment management page. And so you see here, every time someone presses one of those buttons I was showing earlier, the exact attachment that they pulled out is logged against that as a record. And it doesn't show it here. This is an annoying thing about Salesforce list views. You can't actually delete these, but I can't move them without generating my own version of this, and I can't be bothered to do that. Um, but you can't delete these attachments once they've been created. So there's no way someone can come to me and say, I've done this and nothing has happened. I have a log trail there. If the generation has failed, it creates an actual process log down here for me to go and analyze quickly what the error is if I haven't received an error message from the system. 
Um, so it's, a, it's enabled me to one, prove that we needed to improve training on the system, and two, have an even clearer vision of how people are interacting with the system and how I need to change the system slightly to work with them. So once you've got all this information together, you've calculated all the costs, this is a very key part for us. We still, up until around about June, July last year, were then exporting that information and importing it into our Sun system. We did away with Sun and we implemented Financial Force and now using one of their tools called ClickLink, um, if any of you are familiar with Financial Force, it's the best tool I've ever come across. I don't work for them, but I will celebrate that tool. Um, and what it enables us to do is, with the button you saw earlier, prepare payments, that automatically will fly through all the payments that have been approved, and it will create a payable invoice to the school for costs that are for the school, and a manual journal for all supplier costs. So all items that have been flagged as being supplier only costs, it creates those journals within the system. The payable invoice immediately becomes available for payment by our finance team. So finance are no longer running around trying to get information together, it's available straight away. Um, some key aspects of the system, and this is one of the reasons we implemented it, are around duplicate management. Occasionally when you're dealing purely with CSV files, duplicates can creep in. People copying and pasting in Excel is pretty shocking considering it's control C, control V. Um, but you do find duplicates were creeping in prior, and again that's another one of our checks that we always used to have to do at the end of the year. We're now in a position where you can't create a duplicate payment for a student within a term. There can only ever be one payment. If the student doesn't have a record in the system, you can't make a payment to a school. We've had occasions where we found one or two students that received a payment, but we had no record of them within the system. So we had to re retrospectively update. That's no longer the case. So, so what it's enabled us to do, in effect, is apply financial regulation within our program database to ensure that data is accurate and clean at point of entry to feed through into our finance system and completely remove reconciliation between any of our program of financial systems. Um, another key thing that we found, we weren't expecting to come out of it, but we hoped would come out of it, is the real-time donor reporting. If any of you do work for not-for-profits, you'll know how much of a burden that can be. We now, because we link every single academic record to a physical donor code, it enables us to provide access to that donor code and a list of students supported, list of entitlements received, and a total cost for that student. Press that one again. That's it. Does anyone have any questions about that? 